To learn to fly the Pitts S2B, I had to travel a long way, and I knew just who to call to get me there. This to me feels like a, you know longish cross country I would have done in a 172, except for we just literally went to the middle of Canada. Yeah, we crossed half the country. <laughs> That's awesome. Indicating 184 knots, truing out at 302 at 30,000 feet. There's my T's voiceover right there, done. But nope, a challenging landing was also worthy of note. That was tough, Lots man. Of crosswind. I was looking at that windsock, that was tough. I had to work for this landing. The sound of that thing starting up will never get old for you? No. We've got a few days of training lined up. I'm going to be doing advanced aerobatics in the Pitts S2B. Osama's working on his multi-engine rating. And my friend Maron is going to be starting his basic tailwheel. But this is the story of getting there. All right, so what are we doing today? We're flying to St. Andrews uh, near Winnipeg. So we're literally doing a cross country. Yes, <laughs> we're going uh, uh, 870 nautical miles today. In one shot? In one shot, yeah, that's right. That's awesome. We're going to be taking off runway 23, which is a 2,500 foot runway. This is how versatile this plane is. We can take off on a runway that's 2,500 feet, up to 30,000 feet, cruise at 300 knots, and then land on the other end on a runway that's 3,000 feet. Uh, my flight planning starts uh, three to four days before a, a particular trip. I'll look at the general weather on the uh, regular weather forecast. Then I'll check out the airport and I will look at uh, the runways that are available, make sure that the runways are long enough for the performance of the airplane. Then I'll phone the FBOs, get the lay of the land. As I get closer and closer to uh, the flight a couple of days before, I'll start building a flight plan. Your first decision is the altitude. And the rule of thumb with this airplane is for every 100 nautical miles of distance you're traveling, you fly 10,000 feet higher. So if you're going 100 nautical miles, you'll fly it at 10,000 feet. If you're going 200 nautical miles, you'll fly it at 20,000 feet. In this particular case, we can fly all the way up to the service ceiling of the airplane, which is 31,000 feet. But because we're going westbound, it's going to be 30,000 feet. The reason you'd fly higher is because you save fuel. And if you save fuel, you'll have a lot more range in the airplane. The reasons not to fly higher is if you have severe turbulence uh, or if there's weather preventing you from doing that. On this particular day, the weather is excellent and I'm not expecting any turbulence. So that's why we're going to choose uh, 300 as our altitude. We're approaching 18,000. Uh, as you can see, the altimeter is flashing. That's reminding us to go to standard barometer. Oh, yeah. Now so we're at the flight levels. Three, four, zero, and there's no altimeter, it's 2992 all the time. 4, We've also crossed to class A airspace. And everybody is i in class A airspace. In previous episodes, we covered startup and takeoff in great detail. Search TBM850 at flightshops.com to see that. This one's all about flying in the flight levels and really doing what this airplane is meant to do. Yeah, it's so my first time being above 18,000 in a cockpit. Only ever been a passenger in the back above this altitude. So in Canada, um, from the ground to 12.5, you can fly VFR or IFR. From 12.5 to 18,000, you can fly controlled VFR or IFR. Controlled VFR is, it's, it's really IFR without the, without being able to go into the clouds. Okay. Then above 18,000, it's 100% IFR. Uh, as requested. And then from 28,000 to 41,000, it's on VSM. You have to have a special authorization. This airplane and the pilot uh, are both on VSM certified and authorized by Transport Canada. Uh, so we can fly in that uh, reduced vertical separation minimums airspace. And we can talk about what that means in, in, on the flight in the airplane. They, they put them like really close to each other? So let's go back and explain what, why uh, there is RVSM. So it used to be that above 28,000, they used to start separating them by 2,000 feet. But the airspace was getting so congested, they said we have to find a way to uh, get them to be 1,000 feet apart. So they basically, they said, under certain criteria, accuracy of altimeter, training of the pilot, uh, the fact that you're only allowed to fly on our pilot, and the plane and the pilot have to be satisfied for IFR, we're going to start flying them 1,000 feet apart. Two, four, three, seven. Indicated. Right. Today we have full fuel and that five hours and 30 minutes uh, of endurance uh, for the airplane. We've got three souls on board. All right, back there, Marin. I'm great, thanks. All right, cool. Yeah, it's pretty comfy back there, eh? It's awesome. 
in our alternate, which is very important, is um, uh, Winnipeg International Airport. So in this particular case, uh, at the 300 flight level, we're expecting to be in the air for three hours and 26 minutes, use up 203 gallons, and we're gonna have an average headwind of uh, 30 um, knots. Now in this particular case, going westbound, the higher you go, the less the headwind, which is very unusual, but yeah. that confirms my selection of 30,000 feet. Right. If you had a very steep uh, wind gradient, uh, you might want to look at lower altitudes. Always as a rule of thumb, pick the altitude that's going to give you the least fuel burn because that will give you the max range. Once you fly in the flight levels, it's really easy. It's, just, it's the same thing whether you're doing 500 nautical miles, 1,000 nautical miles, or in the case of the Phenom, 2,000 nautical miles. Ultimately, this is where Osama's heading. And spoiler alert, he's since done it. So watch for jet flying episodes coming soon. Anyway, let's get back on board the TBM. So, Rami, we call this the banana bar, and that's when you're going to get to your... Yes, that's, what, that's when we'll get to 230. That's called the banana bar. Oh. Some of it's in there. I'm trying to learn so many different things at once with glass. Uh, I have 3,000 yeah. hours, 2,000 of which are behind glass and synthetic vision. So it's going to be really interesting to see if I can get back to scanning a six-pack. Uh, whether I'm going to be able to fly that airplane or not. There we go, nice. That was Osama's first landing in the Seminole, and in future episodes covering this stuff, we'll check in with him. Uh, I think it's a good challenge that you set yourself up. Are you excited about that aspect of it, or are you considering it a liability? Canada, six, I'm excited, one, but I'm apprehensive two, at the four, same four, time. Because you got a pretty good amount of stuff you want to get done here. I woefully underestimated how little I knew about twins. And, but I've got through all the ground school. My mission is to get the multi-engine, not to learn how to fly a six-pack again. So. But Osama actually picked up the Seminole fairly quickly. I now really hope I can find my plane again. <laughs> but trying to get the entire multi-engine rating done in a couple days was going to be a really big challenge. And the aerobatic flying that I was facing was also going to be fairly intense. Plan to put me straight in the back? Yeah. Okay. So what what do I have back here that you don't have up there? Just so I know. I mean, yeah, I'm going to brief on all that stuff, okay. but you have all the important stuff. Yeah. So a little bit of uh, trust going on. <laughs> Luke has high expectations of me. He sees my videos, he's like, oh, you're so current, you're flying all kinds of tailwheel. I'm like, just so you know, the videos don't directly relate to actually how current I am. Yeah, he gave me like a 300 page yeah, 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 yeah. aerobatics book to read. I got like halfway through it. I think I'm more worried about the landing of this thing than I am about any of the aerobatics. I feel like the, the pit says like legendarily, everyone talks about it being super hard on the ground. I guess we should, what we should talk about maybe is the glass versus six pack thing because that's kind of part of the story here. You know, this is what you fly and it's cool that you took on the challenge to do your multi rating in a six pack. What do you foresee being the challenges? I do have a thousand hours in six packs. I'm hoping it's like riding a bicycle. It'll take me, uh, you know, 15 or 20 minutes to get uh, oriented and, and then I'll, you know, it'll come back to me. We're just going to be doing VFR air work, is my understanding. We talked about the implications of IFR training in a six-pack after flying glass for so long. This plane is missing the NDB option. I mean, how many NDBs are still around, for real? Like, are they still, they're waypoints, but are they still doing them? Oddly enough, you go. Wow. And this is, this is a pure NDB. There is no GPS or overlay. This one you have to fly with a needle. There is no other way. Canada, two, six, three, climb, fly level three, six, zero. Are, are you, <laughs> would you be up to that? Oh, yeah, right? Once upon a time, the instructor showed me how to use it, but I don't even remember. Yeah. Anyway, let's get back to nerding out with all this glass. This here is your indicated airspeed, and this here is your true airspeed. And you can see almost 100 knots difference at this altitude. And this is where it matters, all that stuff that in ground school didn't seem to matter because it was so close when you're dealing with 3,000, 6,000 foot crews in your 172. That's right. This is where it matters. This stuff is so interesting. This thing is basically a mini airliner. I mean, everything it does is like an airliner, right? Okay, so we've got uh, a couple of hours of the cruise over here, so I might as well give you a detailed tour of the cockpit. Starting with all the overhead switches, on my left here are all the controls for the exterior and interior lights. Moving along, this is the master battery switch, uh, so that's how you turn everything on. Uh, this is the generator switch. Uh, and that's how you put the generator on and you select the standby alternator if we happen to lose the generator. Uh, this is the starter switch, that's what we use when we start the engine. What's the candy cane reasoning for that? This is called the crash bar. It's meant so that you can, with one uh, hand, turn everything off okay. uh, right before you uh, ditch or if you're going to have uh, an off-airport landing. 
And this is the oxygen uh, switch, master oxygen switch for the pilot and co-pilot, and we leave that on so that the quick donning masks have oxygen to, to them at all times. Moving down here, this is the autopilot head. We have two uh, redundant primary flight displays, and they get all that information from two independent PTO static systems and AHARs, as well as air data computers. And that's for redundancy in case one of those systems fail. In the middle here, we have our multi-function display. First thing is it has all the engine instruments, so the torque, the prop RPM, the uh, gas generator speed, the internal turbine temperature, oil pressure, and oil temperature. In the middle here, we have the cabin parameters. So right now, the cabin is at 9,200 feet uh, with a pressure differential of uh, 6.0 PSI. This is the pressurization control. From here, we select the altitude that we'll be cruising at, and that will give us a corresponding cabin pressure. I'm reading that as you have it dialed in for 9,000. That's right, and we're at 9,200, within a couple of hundred feet. In the newer airplanes, the TBM 900, uh, this has been eliminated and it's completely managed uh, automatically uh -huh. by, the, by the garments. This box is uh, called the crew alerting system. If something goes wrong with the airplane, we will see the messages over here. And any crew alarm gets acknowledged from the master caution, uh, master warning buttons over here. So you want this empty while you're flying. This is the main uh, power control propeller control, and this is the engine uh, uh, low idle, high idle, and cutoff. I know it looks like a mixture, but it's not. Now, the MFD has many, many functions. First function is it's, it's a moving map. It also allows you to put weather overlays. Uh, so as you can see, we have Nextrad overlaid over here. We can see some snow and some mixed rain snow, a little bit of rain over here. We'll be on top of it, so that's not an issue. Uh, let's go down to the U.S. because I remember when we reviewed the weather in the hangar, we saw a lot of bad weather. If we were flying in this neck of the woods, we'd be concerned that we might not be able to top some of those thunderstorms. The night before the flight and the morning of the flight, I get into my detailed weather planning and briefings. I will check the NOTAMs and make sure that there aren't any NOTAMs that are going to affect us. There aren't any today for our trip. Then I'll go into four flight because it gives me a big picture of what I'm gonna be flying over. I'll put in my route and then I'll go into the menu and start turning on every weather overlay one by one to see what we're looking at. First turn on the radar and as you can see today, all the bad stuff is well south of us. Uh, we're not expecting anything. There's a little bit of snow around uh, Sioux Lookout, but we're gonna be well above it. The next thing I like to do is look at the uh, flight categories, uh, see which airports are IFR and which airports are VFR. And this is just for planning in case we have an emergency and we have a landing short of our destination. There is plenty of VFR and marginal VFR, so I'm comfortable with that. Another uh, thing to look at is visibilities. Uh, again, lots of good visibilities, a couple of places around the Sioux and the Sioux Lookout that we have poor visibilities. I like to build a picture in my head of where are the places where we're gonna be able to land in VFR weather. But we have to also be careful with crossing country borders. We don't wanna go and land in the US unannounced. So in this particular case, we're gonna to have to look for something VFR or marginal VFR uh, just north of the border. And then I'll look at the specific uh, terminal area forecasts. Charlie Yankee Alpha Victor does not have a forecast, but uh, Winnipeg International has a forecast and it's only 12 mi miles southwest. And we're taking off around 1700 Zulu, landing at uh, 20 Zulu. And according to this, 340 at 12, sky's clear. It's, it's beautiful. There is no issues whatsoever. And of course, Oshawa is where we are right now. We'll look at the METAR since we're leaving uh, very shortly. 1788, scattered 3300. We don't have any issues. I've had a tough 2017 weather-wise, so this is very welcome for me today. <laughs> The source of this weather that we're seeing over here is XM, right. satellite weather. There is a delay in broadcasting to you, there's a delay in processing it. So it's really important to use the XM data, especially for radar, for next round, with a lot of caution, because this could you could be looking at a picture from 15 minutes ago. If you're dealing with embedded thunderstorms, you sure don't want to try to skirt them based on that information. Based on that information. This is for strategic planning. Uh, you know, we know there is some bad weather over here. Maybe we should just, you know, go down 40 miles south of that and, and do something like this. If you come in close proximity of embedded thunderstorms and you're in IMC, that means you can't pick your way through them by just looking out the window. The tool to use is this radar, onboard right. radar. So we'll go from standby to weather. And right 
now we are actively scanning. And obviously we don't have any weather ahead of us, but uh, if we did have weather, it will be painting the weather in real time. That's awesome. How far away does the radar beam kind of give you? Uh, it's not very useful more than 40 miles away. And anything over 40, I'm using XM4. Right. We're far enough away that you don't need it in real time. You can just take the big picture from XM. All the stuff that we talked about on the on fourth flight, on the iPad and the hangar, Box is all available via XM weather. Yeah. So you can show the cells and which way they're moving. You can look at sigmets and airmets, METARs, freezing level. Uh, this is uh, really neat. It shows you, it draws all the freezing levels. Um, wind, we're at uh, flight level 300, so we'll push that in. This is the wind that we're experiencing right now. And uh, it's showing we should only have 60. So the actual winds are much stiffer than uh, what was forecast. And we're dealing with almost 90. Uh, we're very close to Sault Ste. Marie. So I'll tell you what they should have been. This is why you want to take a nav log with you, is because you want to compare and see what are you facing. And when you're facing stiffer headwinds, now we have less reserves. You've got to monitor all of these things. Over the Sioux, we should have seen a uh, wind component of 55, and look what we have in your PFD. Yeah. So the wind is much stiffer than was forecast. And it's telling us that we have a 73 knot headwind and a 46 knot crosswind? Uh, that's right. That was not supposed to happen. I'm going to rename this plane uh, Headwinds. <laughs> well, I mean, on the way home, we should get a tailwind, right? Uh, we should, but you'll see, we'll have headwinds. Uh, these four fields here are very important. The first one is uh, our ground speed. Next one is ETE, or estimated time on route. And this is the estimated time on route to the next waypoint. Next field is the total on route time, and that will include an, an approach if I load an approach. And the other really important uh, field is uh, fuel over destination. That's one you should continue to monitor carefully to make sure that you always have sufficient fuel. Uh, we have sufficient fuel to get to our alternate, which is Winnipeg International, and well more than, than 45 minutes of IFR reserves. Other than the environmental system, we didn't cover that. This is typically off during heating operations, which is what we're doing right now with heating, because as you can see, it's minus 46 outside and it's a bit chilly. This is the bleed control. That's a very, very important switch. That's what turns on bleed air to pressurize the cabin. And this is the dump switch, and if you want to dump the cabin or immediately remove the pressurization. In some emergency checklists, they call for you to dump the cabin and don your oxygen mask. Let's talk a little bit about a midway check. So we've been uh, flying around for a couple of hours right now. And what I'd like to do every hour or every couple of hours at the very least um, is uh, look at my nav log and do kind of a midway check to see how we're doing against our flight plan. We're on track from a wind perspective now. We weren't before. And total fuel burn by this time between 200 and 300 is between 113 and 134 and fuel used 122 so we're definitely on track so i'm feeling good about this flight one of the things we want to do is put a zero agl in here so that it can calculate our top descent oh it does it all for you that's sweet you know i do a weight and balance for every single flight and i file it because if anybody ever comes and says, you know, I want to see your weight and balance, you have to have it. Yeah. So I do a weight and balance for every flight. I do a full navigation log for every flight. And I check the uh, performance tables for every flight. For example, we're going to St. Andrews and the runway is 3,000 feet. Is that long enough to land the TBM? There is only one way to answer this question, which is let's look at the performance tables. And we should do this exercise right now. I did it at home. So let's see, uh, the temperature is 10, so that's ISA minus 5, that's why it's important to know. And I'm not going to even take wind into consideration, because the wind shortens the distance, but let's just see without the wind. What's going to be our weight on landing? Landing weight is going to be 5,800 pounds. It looks like our ground roll is 1215, and our distance uh, over 50 foot is 2135. We have 3,000 foot runway, we've got plenty of runway. This airplane uh, is difficult to land with full flaps because with full flaps, unless you, you nail the speed, you're going to land on your nose wheel first. And when you touch down in the nose gear, you're going to strike the prop. Right. This is an Air Force information, Foxtrot. Tower 
observed weather at 1940 Zulu. Winds are 330 at 12 gusty 20. Cavill K. Altimeter 3. X-ray India, India, Winnipeg. Go ahead. X-ray India, India. After Soon Arrows, Victor Bravo, India, recleared direct NORAC, November Oscar, Romeo Alpha Kilo, direct to St. Andrews. Okay, after Victor Bravo, India, direct NORAC, direct St. Andrews uh, Airport for X-ray India, India. X-ray India, India, that is correct. As soon as we hit the top of descent, usually the controllers are very good and because they can see that three degree slope as well and they'll give you a descent. So if, if for instance, if you flew past that and it, you had been clear, you could I'll ask. I'll wait a few minutes. You can uh, ask for it. Yeah, I'll wait a few minutes because there is no harm in being four or five minutes after the top descent. But if he doesn't say anything, uh, then I... Three India, India one ready, descend, fly level 290. 290, X-ray India, India. Oh. X-ray India, India, that's correct. It's just a small X-ray India, to India, contact Winnipeg Center now, 1180. 1180, X-ray India, India. Now we're going to set this. We decided 1300. Now the Vertical cabin track. is descending. Winnipeg, TDM, Charlie Golf, X-ray India, India, 296, descending 290. Charlie Golf, uh, X-ray India, India, Winnipeg, descent to 9000, when ready. The Winnipeg altimeter is 3003. 9000 and 3003, X-ray India, India. We're cleared all the way to 9000. Do you ever have to warn your passengers about their ears, or is that...? Oh, because we're pressurized. Right, we're pressurized. We only need to, to go down 9,000 feet in the time that we go down 30,000 feet. Right. So the plane will not descend faster than 600 feet per minute. Okay. Cabin. Right. That's... So you're not going to feel the des descent. Yeah, that's awesome. Uh, the, f the 1,500 feet, feet per minute is just the outside of the airplane. Yeah, of course, yeah. Hard to wrap your head around that logic. We just crossed to 180. Momentarily, we're going to get the uh, oh, yeah. warning, right? Yeah. So now we need to go to the local altimeter, which happens to be 3003. And it's the IMAV runway 31, uh, starting with opted. Minimums is 1280. In the case of a mist, you have a climbing right turn to 3000 and go to Dutton. All right. Do you want to do like the uh, student version of that briefing? If you have time, do you have time? I do. My horribly uncurrent IFR training would have me do it from top down, and I guess the first thing I would do is make sure I have the right plate and the right date. Yeah, runway 31, it's an on nav, and in this particular case, uh, it is the latest, I loaded the latest charts. I check that on the main screen as part of the uh, boot up. Right. It will show me yellow if there is out-of-date IFR charts. Right, and I'm using four flight. It'll show me a big red thing that says expired. Uh, final uh, course will be 309. This is a GPS approach. We'll double check that. And uh, I've set the minimums at 1280. And in the case of a missed approach, it's a climbing right turn to 3000, direct Duton, and hold on Duton. Cutting this down from a four-hour flight meant I had to make a lot of hard choices, but this was a challenging landing, so I definitely kept it. X-ray India, India Tower, number one, runway 31. Number one, on 31, X-ray India, India. It's a universal pilot thing, you got, got to get your butt situated as part of your downwind check. So. Uh, absolutely. If your butt is off a bit like this or like this, then you're not landing straight. That's right. Don't call it see your pants flying for nothing. Yeah. <laughs> really have to nail the speed on final here because it's a short runway. That comes <laughs> that was crazy attitude. It's going down a mountain here. Amazing. So good for visibility though. Yeah, I can see how this intimidates pilots. You do feel like you're diving at the ground. You get that perspective from back there, Maron? Yep. Isn't that crazy? Looks like we're headed for the uh, the edge of the waterway there. <laughs> and it's because the nose is now like decoupled from the wings. It's like the wings are their own thing now because this fuselage is set up for fast cruise. Anyway, we'll go sterile. X-ray India, India Tower, in variable 310 at 19, clear to land runway 31. Let's land on 31 X and India. Here, inertial separator flaps, you got damper still to go. It is good. Minimums, minimums, 500. Airspeed. Uh, 
That was a good crosswind landing. Wow. Yeah. That was tough, Lots man. Crosswind. I was looking at that windsock. That was tough. Uh, I had to work for this landing. It also shows like you're flying it until you're done, right? Just because uh, you touch down and it ain't over, even in a nose wheel yeah. plane. That was like a tailwheel landing. You had to work it. So huge thanks to Patreon supporters and sponsors for helping us make this content. There's a lot more of this stuff coming, so keep an eye on flightchops.com. And of course, keep your flight chops sharp. How far do we get in the tour? Well, I can, so I can, awesome. I can, can talk forever. <laughs>